Can um, we give it a that, gift? <laughs> you can. <laughs> um, for those that don't know me, my name is Joan Whitlow, and I'm the executive director here at the Customs House Maritime Museum. And before we begin, I have a few quick announcements. Um, I just want to say that Jack Santos, our Zoom jockey and tech support here, applied for a grant for the Mass Humanities and on our behalf, and our application was favorable for the Bridge Street um, sponsorship 2021. You're looking very puzzled. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> to help support I always look that way. Pro programs <laughs> um, to reach a larger audience. Um, although in person these presentations are for members, um, this whole winter with COVID, we've been using our first Fridays as an outreach, and Jack has been taping these and putting them onto our YouTube channels. So if you're not familiar, uh, on our homepage, you go to the bottom, there's a little link that will take you to all of our programs that we have recorded and placed online. So this grant is going to help continue that effort. Um, we purchased the new screen. I think Jack was very envious of the last presenter <laughs> last, <laughs> last time. Um, and we hope to get a bit better camera and also extend our Wi-Fi. So um, thank you, Jack, for doing that. Um, I also just want to let you know that we are planning our Maritime Days uh, this September, September 10th to the 12th. It's going to be shorter and a little bit abbreviated, but we felt it was an important fundraiser not to miss this year. Um, so it's going to be a weekend of activities. I expect that there will be an evening of the Porterman singing, and um, Jack is going to do his famous Yeet Yeet. Uh, don't tell me trivia as the intermission with games and so forth. So um, then later on in the weekend, we hope to have a citywide scavenger hunt, a pirate party, and then a museum on the lawn before the finale, which will be the seat of table on Sunday evening. So plans are still underway, um, but be sure to check our website in the coming weeks because um, as always, we'll be sending out messages, but as we're um, developing our plans and uh, formulate them, they are expected to change a little bit more. So um, before I also start, I just wanted to say that we've arranged for this weather tonight specifically <laughs> for the shipwrecks because if you're ever along the coast on a beautiful sunny day, you would never think there would be these horrific accidents over time. Special effects is right. <laughs> so um, I think this sets the appropriate stage for Captain Ray Bates for his presentation, Shipwrecks North of Boston. Um, Captain Bates is a lobsterman diver and a marine historian, and um, he is also the deputy master of the Salem Marine Society. He's produced a chart of shipwrecks, and they're going to be for sale afterwards. If you haven't looked at them, they're quite um, sort of ex just exceptional in the sense to see the volume over time of how hazardous this coast can be. Um, I think he has documented 1,200 from Winthrop to Cranes Beach. Um, and along with his talk, he's also bought some artifacts that I think um, he would love for you to ask about the peacock. <laughs> yes. And um, so um, books are also available for sale afterwards. So please welcome Captain Ray Bates. Thanks for coming out on a stormy night. Um, some of you may have seen me from my previous engagement here about five years ago. I think I was volume one, uh, the Salem <laughs> Bay um, uh, lecture. But this, uh, this one is the, the uh, volume two, Cape Ann. Uh, it came out about four, the book came out about four years ago, five years ago. We had a grand kickoff at the Cape Ann Museum. And, um, but it, it took a lot of uh, extensive uh, research to, um, to put it all together now. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about are uh, from the earliest shipwrecks to the later shipwrecks. Um, and uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about the history of Cape Ann. And my research actually goes from Magnolia around Cape Ann all the way to the mouth of the Essex River. Unfortunately, I don't get up to the Newburyport area, but um, that's maybe something in the future. But um, uh, you have to really uh, accredit uh, an individual from Rockport uh, and who inspired me when I was even, even like 16 years old. He in the 19, or early, or late 60s, he was a um, junior at um, Rockport High School, Paul Sherman, and he researched before microfilm and everything else. He researched the shipwrecks around Cape Ann and produced a chart. It's a fantastic chart. Um, he was a diver also. 
Unfortunately, he was killed in uh, Seabrook Nuclear. He died. He died at Seabrook Nuclear uh, facility as a hard hat diver around 1984 or five. Uh, they think he had a heart attack or something like that. But I, uh, when I came out with my first book, I asked, and, and I was going to come out with the second one. I called the widow up and I said, "Did he have any ar archives?" And yeah, she said, "I have boxes and boxes, of not only." index cards documenting the shipwrecks, but also photos that you can use toward this pub publication. So I dedicated this book to Paul. Um, so I wanted to give him the credit before continuing. Um, they basically, um, Cape Ann uh, was a thriving uh, Native American uh, uh, region, uh, the uh, part of the Algonquin Nation up there. But the first, uh, Besides the Vikings, as everybody knows, uh, before, before the first documented was uh, the French explorer Champlain, who on July 15, 1604, landed in um, Smith Cove. Uh, it's over by Rocky Neck, and anchored there and met with the uh, the natives. Um, and he explained. He, he drew a chart, an actual chart of Cape Ann. Yes, um, that's that's a, a lithograph of Cape Ann, but I think. Well, Anyway, um, the three in, the three industries of yeah the, the three industries of, uh, of of Cape Ann initially was fish. Uh, fish stations were set up. Um, shipbuilding was important. And early 1820s, um, grant in, grant industry industry came about. So as far as na uh, maritime tra uh, commerce, those three industries were key to um, to Cape Ann's development. Um, the I'm going to get into the shipwrecks right now. The, um, the next, to, next. Most people uh, imagine a shipwreck from the 1600s as sitting there on the bottom, fully intact, sails uh, sails up. Uh, but in reality, a lot, a lot of variables uh, account to a shipwreck breaking up. And the first um, first scene, it may lay on lay on its side, it may sink. And the shallower a wreck happened, the quicker it would break up. Deep water wrecks take a lot longer. There isn't the storm surge. But various things happen, like electrolysis, the electrolytic uh, current in the water, storm surge, uh, tornado worm, which makes driftwood, eats away at the wood. The second phase, would it's, she starts breaking up after like 20, 30 years, starts folding out. All the fittings that go, she starts springing the back. Uh, silt starts to cover in the wreck. Uh, the third phase is there's very little left of the wreck coming out uh, you know, 80, 90 years later. And eventually, the whole wreck site is covered by a layer of mud and silt. This is beneficial to all artifacts because it actually preserves the wreck uh, for future excavations. Um, this is a, this is Champlain's uh, chart that he drew, um, and he uh, he actually anchored. This is this is Easter, uh, Eastern Point, the Inner Harbor. Uh, this is his ship at anchor off of Rocky Neck right there. Uh, but he did the depth and uh, fathoms and. Um, but you can see all the, the villages here. He one thing he did talk about is the uh, extensive gardens they had, um, and he, the artichokes, the biggest artichokes he's ever seen. Uh, and I looked it up. I mean, regular artichokes, there were long native artichokes, but with poles. But um, it was a thriving community. It was a huge epidemic a few years ago that wiped out like 90, 80, 80 or 90 percent of uh, the East Coast uh, North New England tribes. Um, and when uh, Governor Winthrop entered uh, Salem Bay, he described Marblehead, my hometown, as a place of hundreds of unburied skeletons. Uh, and they think it was either smallpox or some pandemic. But when Champlain was there, it was a thriving, thriving community. Okay, the first shipwreck I'm going to talk about is the uh, the one and F. Um, Marblehead uh, in the early 1600s was a um, a, a place of un, uh, unholy people. Um, and uh, they were all kicked out of Salem, supposedly. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, uh, uh, Isaac Allerton, one of the leading citizens of Marblehead, uh, wanted a, a minister to establish a church in Marblehead. So he uh, contacted Reverend uh, Anthony Thatcher and his cousin, Reverend uh, John Ivory, uh, Avery of Newburyport, in the summer of 1635, pleaded with them to come down to Marblehead to establish a church. So. Um, Isaac Allerton sent a small pinnace, uh, which is a small uh, two-masted vessel, um, to Ipswich to pick them up. Thatcher describes it as a bark, uh, which is just sail configuration. Uh, on August 11th, um, in 1635, 23 people, 11 in the Avery family, 7 in the Thatcher family, and the rest were crew members, 
uh, departed from Ipswich. Now, that was August 11th. On the 14th, she was still tacking off of Cape Ann. Now, there was no, in 1635, there weren't the roadways. There, there wasn't a way of getting from Ipswich to Marblehead. The only viable way was by sea. But if you're under sail back there with no auxiliary power, you're, 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 a lot, you're subject to wind direction or, or doldrums or whatever. Uh, but on the, uh, the uh, evening of the 14th, a huge uh, uh, easterly, northeasterly wind occurred, and she started the, the, um, the watch and wait started dragging her anchors. Uh, throughout the night, there were the crew members and the, and the passengers were huddled down in the, in the trunk cabin. It described a little trunk cabin in the back, but the anchors were holding for a while until she finally, um, a couple big waves cra crashed over her. She, she slammed into a ledge and started to break up. They were all praying on, uh, as they all believed that that, that was their, their fate. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, she was lifted under a large boulder, becoming wedged. The foremast was cut away. Everybody retreated to the stern of the, uh, of the vessel. The bow begins to break apart also, and uh, a large wave broke the rest of the vessel up, throwing everybody into the water. After a long time, Reverend Thatcher was thrown onto a rocky um, pebble beach, uh, soaking wet, exhausted. Uh, it is August, uh, um, so it, you know it's, it's, it's warmer water, but they're wearing, still wearing heavy wool clothes. Nobody knows how to swim back then. Um, the, uh, later, his wife also crawled, crawled ashore, so it was only uh, Reverend, um, Reverend Thatcher and his wife. He, uh, some other debris started washing up, a flint powder, uh, some cheese, and a dead goat washed up. They managed to get a fire going, cook the goat, dry their clothes off. One body of the Thatcher's nieces washed up um, on the beach also. Uh, Monday, a passing sloop uh, came by the island, and they re retrieved uh, Reverend Thatcher and his wife. Uh, the Reverend did move to Marblehead. He established a church there, and later he was granted by the colonial government what is now known as Thatcher's Island, the island that he uh, actually uh, was cast upon. I uh, still debate nowadays which rock they really hit, and there's an Avery's rock off a of of rock board, uh, but it seems pretty far away to anybody that would see the scenario of it all. Uh, it, it had to be right up onto the Pretty close to the raw, uh, to the island for to for survivors to make it. Yes. So, so they were sailing fairly close to the land then. Well, they probably were offshore trying to catch a wind, uh, and yeah, the, the wind was an easterly driving them closer and closer to right. the to the shore. Um, but yeah, I mean, like what, like five, three days, three or four days. Uh, but anyway, the uh, in 1639. Four years after he established the church, uh, the Thatcher and his wife moved to Yarmouth, uh, Cape Cod. They had three more children, and they established a church down there. But that was Reverend Anthony Thatcher, and the wait, the vessel, the wait and wash, 1635. Okay, this is um, the the chapter is the uh, States Bee. It's the uh, Mar uh, March 11th, 1776, during the Revolutionary War. December uh, 27th, 1774, the HMS Folly, a 20 gun uh, ship of the British Navy uh, blockaded Salem Bay. Uh, they forced all of um, the Marblehead Beverly uh, privateering fleet, fleets. Um, and, you know, Marblehead, as I told the Beverly Historical Society, being the birthplace of the American Navy, um, didn't get a good response on that. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the, uh, the the two the two um, the two fleets of privateers uh, they couldn't operate effectively. So they they, they what they did is they uh, they 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 all, one by one, they, tr they managed to evade the foul leave, which was on blockade, and sneak up to Cape Ann, which was a more protected, isolated harbor. They could get to the inner harbor and operate as a base there. Um, in March of 1776, uh, uh, yeah, the uh, 17th Commodore John Manley of the Hancock, uh, privateer Hancock, uh, he spotted, on uh, uh, March 10th, he spotted a vessel going into Boston. Uh, the privateers Hancock, Fra uh, Franklin, Lee, and Lynch all set off. So you've got four privateers heading for this mysterious ship trying to go into the besieged. Boston was besieged at this time into Boston. Um, actually, the capture, uh, they captured the 300-ton vessel called the Statesby. It had sailed 17 weeks earlier from England. Uh, the position in the Boston Harbor was frail at the time. 
Captain uh, James Watt was a skipper of the British ship, the skates being, and it had a cargo of 180 casts of porter, 50 casts of vinegar, sauerkraut, uh, cheese, coal, and three live hogs. Food that was desperately needed for the um, British troops stationed in um, in Boston at the time. You got to figure that the Patriots have got captured the heights of Dorchester Heights and and things are start <coughs> deteriorating rapidly for the British. Um, <coughs> Dense fog, uh, uh, as, they, were, as they, they captured the uh, state speed, they were towing it back to Gloucester, and um, a dense fog toward dusk, uh, the, the state speed mistook the um, entrance to uh, the harbor and struck on uh, Bemo Ledge, which is uh, on the other side of Eastern Point, uh, near Brace Cove. It's also called False Cove, because in a fog, stormy weather, it looks like the mouth of Gloucester Harbor, but um, the, 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 the prize crew mistook it. Uh, at the time. Uh, the next three days, she struck on the ledge. She sat there uh, like that, and for the next three days, salvage uh, people from the shoreline coming out in dinghies and boats and everything were offloading as much as they could of their cargo. Um, March 15th, uh, the British brig Hope shows up, sends in an armed longboat outside rifle range from land, uh, and they grabbed what they could. The British grabbed what they could. They chased the Patriots off. Uh, they decided, well, we can't salvage it, we're not going to leave it to the Patriots. They burned the vessel, the States Beat, uh, on BMO Ledge. So, uh, uh, later that week, Boston was evacuated. And meanwhile, months later, vessels coming from England, loaded with, with provisions, not knowing that Boston had been evacuated, they were still being captured by our privateers. Because um, the whole fleet of uh, in Boston sailed and the, you know, the, the British civilians and troops had sailed back up to Nova Scotia. But that was the States Bee uh, on 1770, March 11, 1776. Um, this is, uh, this is the, the graveyard, the old gra graveyard off of uh, Commonwealth Ave in, uh, in, in Gloucester. It uh, dates back to 1644. Um, the next vessel I'm going to talk about is the ship industry, January 11, 1796. Um, the, the, uh, on the evening of January 11th, 1796, a huge ocean storm was uh, brewing off of Cape Ann. Uh, the ship's captain of the industry, Miles Barnes, had left Portsmouth, England, November 3rd, in ballast, bound for his home port of Boston. In ballast, for you that aren't familiar with this, it means no cargo, just they used to have to uh, put stones in the bottom of the in, inside the ship to weigh it down. Otherwise, you would just roll over once the sails were up. So in ballast means and if they took on a cargo, they'd have to take the rocks, a certain amount of rocks out to weigh the vessel properly. Um, but anyway, the, the industry was in ballast, heading back to Boston. Um, uh, Thomas Lewis was the owner. He was a prominent uh, merchant in Boston. They struggled to stay offshore during the storm, but eventually uh, the, the easterly winds drove them onto Salt Rock, a Salt Island, right off of Good Harbor Beach. Um, January 11th, ice cold water, totally wrecking in minutes. The next morning, locals found ships, uh, the ship's boat ashore with two trunks of, in it, 119 guineas of coin, and ship's papers uh, with the captain's logbook. The last entry was at uh, 8 p.m. describing horrible conditions uh, offshore on the industry. Um, captain, the captain, first mate, and three crewmen um, bodies were recovered over the next few days. Uh, funeral, was, uh, um, funeral was given out of the first parish meeting house, Reverend Eli Forbes gave the service and it was well attended. Flags in all the ships in the harbor were half mass for the service. The captain's body was carried by two Gloucester sea captains and the crew, the crew uh, members' bodies were taken up by other seamen. The industry's owner, Lewis and Son, attended and uh, wrote letters of appreciation in the Salem Gazette for their treatment of their, lo their lost crew members. Um, I found, even next one. I roamed through, I knew the body, I knew the bodies were born, buried in this cemetery and um, I, I roamed through the cemetery. I don't know if you ever saw the, the movie, uh, The Good, the Bad, the Ugly, and Tuco's looking for the gold, you know, <laughs> he's running around. So I was running around looking for the industry uh, uh, stone, and sure enough, I found it. It's very faint, I wish it was a better image of it, but it says Captain, Mom, you know, Captain uh, Miles Barnes and the, uh, the uh, crew members of the industry. And it's it, it's actually should be dug out a little bit and, and re-etched. Uh, would be kind of nice. But the whole that cemetery is not well kept, and um, the stones are very very old. So, but that was the uh, the ship industry.
Okay, now we're getting to the War of 1812, um, the attack on Annesquam Harbor, June uh, 13, 1814. The War of 1812, uh, the main grievan grievances uh, were uh, impressment of U.S. sailors, disruption of trade, and seizing of um, Gloucester fishing schooners. Uh, late spring, uh, the, I mean, war, the war broke out, but by the late spring of 18, 1814, the HMS Nymph was anchored off of Cape Ann doing uh, blockade duty. Uh, they were trying to bottle up all the harbors along the east coast of the United States. Uh, Captain uh, Henry Edward Napier uh, was the skipper, uh, was the lieutenant on board, and he kept a journal, a concise journal, which uh, is a treasure for the historians of modern day. The nymph arrived in May, set up station in Ipswich Bay. He had three si sailing barges uh, to attack in close. These were like shallow water, uh, wide, um, um, like schooner rigged that could slip into the shallows and capture anchored vessels uh, in the harbors and get away fast enough. June 5th, 1815, uh, the barges sent uh, were seized a newly built uh, vessel by the name of the Welcome Home. She was two mast, two masted vessel. She was owned by Gideon Lane of uh, Annisquam and crewed, crewed by Gideon Lane's two sons. Now they brought the, the, the Welcome Home alongside the nymph, tied it up and, and impounded the two sons. Uh, the cargo was uh, uh, on, the, on the welcome home with notions. Notions were dry goods at the time. So they held, the nip held it for ransom. The father had to go find money to ransom off his two sons and his vessel. A week later, June 13th, the bar, two barges attacked Annisquam Harbor. Two vessels that uh, at, were at anchor in, Gloucester, in, in Annisquam Harbor. One was a cargo of lime. The British set the cargo of lime vessel afire. Uh, that was the most dangerous cargo in, uh, for uh, in the age of sail. They had to be double lined, they had to be in barrels because any moisture, condensation, whatever, that hit the lime cargo would ignite it you know, on fire and it would, there's no way of putting it out other than blockading up all, uh, all the, all the uh, air vents going down into the bilge. Many a vessel, one happened to sail right at Derby Wharf, right? they came down with the cargo from Maine of, of, uh, in the 1800s of, uh, of lime and a two tied up at the dock on an offload the next day and two guys were passing the jug of whiskey over the open hole, the whiskey dropped into the, and it burnt right down to the water's edge. I mean, so that, that's, that was one of the vessels uh, at anchor was uh, set afire. Another vessel uh, uh, tied up to the town dock was named the Federalist. Uh, it, it was a strong wind blowing at that day. And if you, in the American political party, the Federalists were the ones that didn't want to go to war with, with the British. So the British shot uh, Lieutenant Na Napier there. Um, the Annisquam legend has it that um, uh, the owner's uh, daughter, a 17-year-old Clara Lane, was standing in front of the vessel trying to stop the British from burning it. Uh, she was supposedly gorgeous, and Lieutenant Napier fell for her and <laughs> spared the vessel. <laughs> how, much, how much of that goes? But it, it was, uh, they did spare the, because he also, Napier writes in his journal that he's, he's afraid if he did light it at that town wharf, that he'd burn down the whole Annisquam village. Uh, but uh, Clara's two, he explained to uh, Clara that her two brothers, oh, this was also her two brothers that, um, that were uh, uh, being held for ransom. He, he explained that they're being well treated. Uh, but while leaving, the, while, the two, while the two barges uh, were leaving Annisquam Harbor, they see the small tobacco boat with salted fish. Um, three days later, uh, he writes in his journal that the ransom was paid, $3,500. Uh, Gideon Lane had gone to Boston, got the money. Uh, so the welcome home and the two sons were released. Um, the remains of two vessels are still under the sand of Annisquam Harbor, because um, they, they, they sank another vessel too. Uh, but someday, you know, modern archaeologists could probably find the remains of that lime schooner in the other vessel. Okay. Uh, this is the Brig Persia, uh, one of Salem's uh, uh, premier uh, East India men uh, vessels that actually broke into the pepper trade in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in uh, the South Seas. Uh, uh, the evening of March 5th of uh, 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 1829, a violent easterly, southeasterly uh, ocean storm, uh, snowfall reduced visibility to about a ship's length. Uh, the Persia was jockeying off of Cape Ann. She was coming back uh, to Salem. Um, the uh, John, Captain John Thistle of Beverly um, and two, a crew of 12 were uh, aboard the vessel at the time. 
at the time, two lights were operating. Uh, Thatcher's Island, established in 1771, and the beacon at Baker's Island, set up by the Salem Marine Society, which I am a you know, deputy master, and, uh, in 1798. There were no lights at the time on Eastern Point to guide people in, vessels into here. He was actually trying to get into any lee he could. He was trying to get into, into uh, Gloucester Harbor. But he was disorientated in the snow or storm. Um, the, uh, the Persia was a copper, uh, a copper um, sheathed vessel built at the Magoon Shipyard in Salem in uh, 1822. So she was seven years old. Uh, she was owned by Salem merchants. She had a 17-year career uh, brought back. Um, yes, oh yeah, 17-year career but brought back uh, spices, goods from the faraway ports. Her last voyage was Trieste, uh, and she had a cargo of uh, aboard of 1,000 bales of rags and sumac. She had left uh, November 25th, 1828, uh, on an uneventful crossing. But. Um, the, uh, the wreck was not found until Saturday, March 7th, so two days after this. There was such a huge storm. The snowfall was record height that the people of Gloucester in Eastern Point didn't, it was way steep snow, they didn't get down to the water's edge until two days later. Um, the ship had struck uh, at Brace Cove, that false harbor I talked about, and within minutes was made into splinters. Uh, the, the granite shoreline and a storm, and I'll give you an example. Uh, in one of my artifacts here. I found this diving um, unknown vessel, but that was a straight ship's pin. But it shows you the impact of uh, broadside of a wooden vessel in a height of a, of a huge ocean storm. That bent that, the torque on that is deadly and phenomenal. It's not like going up on a sandbar in the Cape or the Carolinas. Uh, there's granite ledges. And what it, the, the newspapers at the time, they don't, they don't, they don't, they, they describe what the bodies look like afterwards. It's not very, you know. Anyway, the, um, the, the it said uh, they made it splinters. Torn bodies were wedged so tight into the rock premises that it took uh, multiple uh, people to pull them out. The first day, nine bodies were retrieved. Captain's, Captain Thistle and his first mate, also a son-in-law, uh, Nathaniel Seward of Beverly, were, uh, their bodies were sent back to Beverly. I actually went to the Beverly, um, uh, the graveyard I believe they were in. I found two other Captain Thistles. And then there was a blank spot, according to the chart I had, uh, a stone was missing, but that's where I think his grave site was. But I never did authenticate that. Um, Captain Thiz, uh, is, is, it, uh, the, the Universalist Church uh, uh, gave the service and burial. Uh, retrieval of the, set, uh, of the cargo became, a, became some kind of a, um, a firestorm of controversy. Uh, the Salem Register, uh, the Salem newspaper, the Register, uh, accused locals, Gloucester people, of looting dead bodies and cargo. Uh, the Gloucester tele Telegraph uh, uh, fought back and sent a, a broadsheet saying that the locals collected the goods for salvage. Uh, cargo was insured for $37,000. Um, the stern board of the Brig Persia is supposedly somewhere in the collection of the Peabody Museum, Peabody Essex. Uh, I tried finding it, and they, they, uh, they don't know where it is, uh, but it's research, the research I did said it was there. Yes? I'm just curious about, about the cargoes that you've been talking about. You talked about money <clears throat> and then rags? Well, yeah, rags. Uh, it, it, it's a various amount, but those were the main the, uh, rags, a uh, thousand ba bales of sumac uh, and rags uh, and other cargoes. There would be other cargoes in it. Uh, what, what was the purpose of those? Why Insurance. The, the, oh, the, the, the usage? I, I, I don't know. I don't really know. Uh, industry, I suspect. But anyway, they, what they did, they found out later, the controversy was boiling over. The people that collected the, the goods were stashing it in crevices and hiding places so others wouldn't steal it. They wanted to collect the, so when you collect the wreckage, you, you have first rights to the insurance company for, for salvage rights. So they'd pay you. But anyway, um, the, uh, because of this tragedy, a lighthouse was established on Eastern Point in January uh, 1832. So, so three years later, a lighthouse was established. Okay, the year 1839 had a series of three devastating storms off the North Shore. Um, the barometer, um, December 15th, the barometers plunged toward the, uh, uh, on the evening of the 14th, 60 vessels uh, up and down the east coast, uh, the northeast rather, uh, sought safety in, in Gloucester Harbor. So by you know 1839, they had ways of telling that 
you know, some bad weather's coming in, let's find a nice safe place to go in. So most of them anchored in an area called um, the Pancake Ground, which is the, isn't the inner harbor of Gloucester, it's the outside Ten Pound Island. I hope some of you are familiar with the geography here. But anyway, it's a soft bottom, anchors hold very well. It's, uh, you've got the Magnolia Cliffs on one side, Eastern Point on the other, but it's, it's protected basically in big storms. Um, the American Coast Pilot uh, 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 booklet at the time even recommended it, uh, uh, that section to anchor, but failed to mention an even safer anchorage inside, pound, inside Five Pound Island. Five Pound Island no longer exists. It's where the state pier is. They filled that all in. It, that was inside, Five Pound Island was inside Ten Pound Island. Uh, so, um, the, but the southeast uh, gale, wind of gale force was, uh, came in late at that night. Waves were breaking over Dog Bar. Now, Dog Bar is a, is, was a natural granite ledge that goes from Eastern Point, um, like a half a mile or a quarter of a mile out toward the Magnolia shoreline. It's a shallow area, but it was never marked properly in earlier maritime history. Uh, but the waves are now breaking over that. Uh, rain and snow would have, was obscuring visibility. Mountainous waves of incoming waves crashed against the cliffs at Norman's Woe in the Magnolia shoreline. And what was happening was they'd bounce off those cliffs, come back and meet the incoming waves, and they were doing that. The boats at anchor were jerking back and forth. Their lines were fraying. Uh, the anchors weren't holding. They were cutting the, cutting the masts down and the sails just to stop the windage on it and preserve their position. Um, meanwhile, the uh, uh, yeah, a crewmen were lashing themselves to the mast. Fury reached his peak at 2 o'clock, 2 a.m. on Monday. Toward dawn, two rescue vessels, the Van Buren and the Custom House boat, uh, got volunteers, got all rigged out, let's go out into the harbor, and the storm's still raging, but it's, it's past its peak. But there's devastation everywhere along the shoreline. Um, anyway, the Van, the Van Buren was the larger vessel and it was decked over. Uh, with reefed sails and stout volunteers, they went out into the fury. Captain Henry, Harry Pugh of the Van Buren, this is a technique he used and it's brilliant. He had anchor upwind of the, uh, of the stricken vessels and then drift back a dory uh, to the stern of his boat to the stricken vessels. The people on the stricken vessel would jump into the dory and all the crew members would winch it back the dory back to his boat, load them on, and then go to the next vessel and repeat this over and over and over again. Um, the volunteers would pull them in. The three trips were, were sent out and saved over 100 sailors uh, by boat and both vessels. Um, this was all being witnessed from the cliffs of Magnolia by the citizens of Gloucester. They could look down at all the tragedy. Bodies were strewn all along the Norman's Wall and the, the it, Okay, of the 60 vessels, uh, only 20 uh, uh, were uh, there after the, uh, the blow, and they had cut their masts down. Uh, two vessels snapped and drifted across the harbor and crashed onto the south shore uh, beaches, uh, south of Boston. Over 40 dead, 20 bodies were recovered. Uh, local fisheries were not affected because December, the fishing vessels were all hauled out. Their season was over. This was all mer uh, merchant maritime uh, <coughs> interest. Uh, this is when... Um, the, the poet Longfellow uh, wrote the, the famous uh, incident, the, uh, the poem rather, The Wreck of the Hesperus, um, Norman, on Norman's Well. Well, here's a little trivia question. Yeah, it did wreck, the Hesperus did wreck in the December 15th, 1839 storm, but it wrecked at Rose Wharf in inner Boston Harbor. Uh, yeah, Longfellow used literary, uh, you know, free will or whatever, and, you know, well, these vessels that wrecked here aren't really, they don't really have it, so I'll use the, uh, I'll use the Hesperus. So that's, um, that's the one. Okay, this is the next vessel, is the schooner on the Abbey, Abbe, uh, P. Kramer, uh, September 12, 1888. <clears throat> the three-masted schooner, Abby Kramer, had left Philadelphia on September 8, uh, 12, 1888 with a cargo of soft coal destined for Newburyport. Okay. Uh, by the 1880s, coal, coal was used not only uh, in industry, but it was used in houses. Um, the stoves were, uh, you went from the Franklin stove, which uh, didn't burn coal, to more modern coal burning, um, like, an old timer told me one time, you know, you, you, you have to have, and I have a coal stove actually in my detached garage. Where there's no, you know, environmentalists here. But, uh, <laughs> I, 
I have to get my uh, agwit in my cold, but you have to shut the main door on it uh, and vent the top and keep the draft down below the main door. Otherwise, you can't start a coal fire and it won't stay. If you have the main door open, it won't burn. But they finally got it by the 1800s. Um, so on, um, the Captain uh, Norman Mary and five crew members and Mary's wife were on board the, the vessel. Stormy weather and two gales off the coast. It was a tough ride up from Philadelphia. They came into Gloucester Harbor uh, Saturday, September 22nd, 1888 to make repairs. Sails were torn, uh, rigging was ruined. Uh, Monday night, uh, they, they fixed everything. Monday night, they set sail for the final voyage around Cape Ann to Newburyport. Short sure little, sure little jockey uh, distance of modern day terms. But once again, we're dealing with wind uh, and, and natural occurrences. Um, the, um, a northeasterly struck as they were coming around Cape Ann. And finally, uh, it, it was such intensity that the Martingale uh, spar under the bowsprit snapped. Now you can see that that, that, that rigging underneath there uh, snaps. So now you've got this flop, flopping away here, uh, not supported, which also supports the masts up, uh, up on top. Um, the, uh, the uh, let me see, the, uh, the spar and the bowsprit snapped also. Uh, but they tried to head back to Gloucester, but couldn't. So they anchored in Bayview. Another schooner, the uh, W.I. Hines, had wrecked and snapped her cable, sending her to, into Coffin's Beach. Uh, their crew landed safely. Uh, around 12.30, now the Cranmer is loaded with coal. She's deep in the water. She's heavy. Um, around 12.30 a.m., the Cranmer's cables also snapped her, sending her broadside into the beach, Coffin's Beach once again. She struck a sandbar 300 yards off the beach uh, with this heavy load. Um, the crew, crew retreated to the galley, but waves were soon tearing that apart. Uh, the cabin roof was next, but waves soon boarded that. So. We've got, not, got the crew members, the captain, and his wife um, trying to scurry to the highest position. Uh, crew, the, the, they crawled into the uh, rigging and started tying themselves off. Uh, the crew covered Mrs. Mary, uh, the captain's wife, with canvas and lashed her to the rigging. Okay? Uh, it's September, so it's early September, so it's not really frigid cold temperatures. Um, Bayview Light, Light Station. There's a, there was one of the humane life stations over in Bayview. They um, they're 10 miles away, but they had a carriage horse, and they got there at 5 p.m. Uh, but only four charges to the Lyle gun, the, the, the gun that shoots the grapple out to the vessel, so they could set up the breaches for me. Uh, they only had four shots. The first two missed, but the second two um, landed. The Anasquam Lifesavers, another humane society group, they arrived from Anasquam, and um, they sent the boat out to the wreck. They took off. They wet, wet exhausted uh, survivors. And it was a hazardous run because the waves were crashing into the beach. But they all got there safely. The vessel was auctioned off as she laid. On no November 26, uh, 1888, she was, a storm broke her up. She was built in um, 1867 uh, in Baltimore, Maryland, um, home port of New York City. This is the schooner Mexican, um, 18, uh, October 17th, 1890. Uh, October 10th, um, seven days prior, the small schooner loads up with 120 tons of coal in New York. Destination were Richmond, Maine. Good the weather was uh, proceeded up the coast. Captain P.A. Lawrence and um, two of his three crew members were aboard the vessel. Uh, she was rounding Cape Ann uh, with a southwest westerly uh, wind. Suddenly it changed uh, 2 a.m. in the mornings to a strong southeast tempest. Uh, rain began to, uh, uh, to commence, zero visibility in the darkness. The vessel started leaking. Uh, she was an older vessel, and so they started man manning the pumps. She also has that heavy cargo of coal in it. Uh, 4 a.m., two hours later, she decided to head to Portsmouth because of the wind direction. But at 6 a.m., the foresail blows out. Half hour later, the mainsail blows out. The jib is soon, soon follows, so no, no more sails. Um, the way she's drifting, um, uh, she, she's off of Isla Shoals, close to Isla Shoals, when the wind shift to the southeast again, uh, to the north. So Captain Lawrence, now just with his rudder and steering wheel, is trying to make it to Gloucester. Uh, the, crew, the crew is losing their efforts in dewatering the, 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 the boat because the planks are all now stressed and they're popping open. Um, the, uh, they couldn't reach Gloucester Harbor, so they started to head toward the Anasquam. 300 yards off the Anasquam Lighthouse, 
uh, uh, the vessel begins to settle into the water. The Davis Net life health, life saving crew sprung into action. They launched the boat at the same time the schooner launched themselves into their own boat. So they had a, a little small uh, uh, lifeboat that they could get into the, for themselves. The crew fight, fought through the surf, but they finally made it safely to the beach just below the Anasquam Lighthouse. Lifesavers uh, brought the crew to the station, gave them dry clothes and warm, uh, uh, dry clothes and warm food. Uh, the scooter struck broadside on the rocks next to the lighthouse. Uh, the cargo was strewn all over the beach. Uh, she was sold at auction to the wreckers. She was built in 1872, so she was 22 years old. That's back in the age of schooners. That was an old vessel. She had made a lot of money for her owners, but uh, she was worked hard. Um, and she's uh, owned in Bucksport, Maine, uninsured vessel and cargo. Uh, this is the uh, schooner Eleanor Van Dusen. Um, this is Eastern Point Lighthouse. Uh, this is where I'm drawing the line right here is Dog Bar. And at the time, um, uh, in 1900, this is uh, September of 1900, the, the Dog Bar breakwater, the modern day breakwater is being constructed. Uh, so various cars, barges are coming with slabs of granite, dumping it into the water, dumping it into the water. But they're not clearly marking where they're dumping it into the water. Uh, so on the morning of September 10, 20th, uh, 1900, the three master schooner Eleanor Van Dusen departed Rockport Granite Company in Bayview, bound for New York with a cargo of paving stones and raw granite. It was consigned to uh, E.S. Marston of New York. Uh, $4,000 insurance covered it. Captain H.W. Godfrey sailed uh, until late night, uh, late night uh, well, far well offshore of Cape Ann, a south South Gale forces him back into Gloucester Harbor. Uh, he was going to spend the night in Gloucester Harbor in the lee of it. As he was appro approaching the Eastern Light, um, Point Lighthouse, clear visibility, new charts in hand, uh, the new underwater breakwater being constructed, no lights, buoys, or chart, or on the chart. So he had current charts. He strikes hard onto the ledge um, with a cargo of granite. So you're talking hard granite striking on and a hard granite of cargo. Uh, an hour and a half, he's blowing the horns of distress and getting no response, okay? Uh, the vessel starts settling into the water and force the crew members and the captain into the boat. After a long struggle and a heaving, rolling swells, he made it to Pavilion Beach uh, in Gloucester, seven people uh, on board. The next day at 2 p.m., the vessel caught fire mysteriously, burns throughout the night. Uh, the next morning, the stern burnt away, and uh, the mitts and masts and sails. Salvage lighters arrived, but it was too late. Storms later in the fall uh, and winter breaks her apart. She's the 27th incident of vessels being wrecked on the construction of Dog Bar <laughs> at the time. And I believe it, I believe it, the eventual tally was like 51 or something, you know, before they finally finished it. She was built in 1874, owned in Tuckahoe, uh, New Jersey. Um, but that's the Eleanor Van Dusen. This is the steamer Wilster, uh, February 28, 1902. On the evening of uh, March 28th, um, uh, uh, no, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, March 28th, uh, uh, 1902, February uh, 1902, foggy rain, low visibility. Captain J. O. Fuchs had struggled to find his bearings off of Cape Ann. The Wilster had left um, the island of Malta on January 30th. Um, in 1902, with uh, 3,125 bags of sugar valued at $100,000, consigned to the American Sugar Refining Company in Boston. Uh, the captain reduced throttle, be, uh, had ordered soundings being made. At 6.30, she struck on a ledge. Captain reversed and the vessel and struck on another ledge. The Wilster had five watertight compartments at the time. Uh, the captain orders, uh, ordered that all, all compartments sealed. Uh, he threw out, a, he set two anchors, only two, one, water was found in only one of the compartments. But a sudden, um, so, a strong southeasterly swell uh, was occurring and the anchor started to drag the vessel towards shore. Distress signals were sounded and, uh, the, and lit. Finally, she struck on Salt Island's ledge off of uh, Briar Neck section of, of Cape Ann. Um, the anchors dragged it further 200 yards and ended up on Long Beach off of Cape Hedge. This is Long Beach, Cape Hedge, 
at the time. 23 men were aboard. It was a soft landing area compared to most of Cape Ann. I mean, Cape Ann doesn't afford you many places that correct on that you don't, you're not going to be whittled to pieces. Um, the uh, mountainous waves were now bursting over the uh, deck and rigging. Uh, after a long time, signal lights were seen from shore, and Captain Bierce and the crew of the Gap Head, another life-saving station, uh, arrived uh, at 12, uh, 12 p.m. and fired projectiles into the ship. Uh, the breaches, they're, they're trying to get the, the hooks snagged onto these riggings up here. What they'll do is they'll attach a thing called a breaches buoy to the shore with a bucket in it, and it's like a clothesline situation. One at a time, they'll reel you from the shore to, from the wreck, wreck vessel to the land. Um, the second officer, Robert Smith, maintained the high ground up, up, on, the, up on the spars, uh, and let, he was the last to leave uh, uh, after uh, the last man was retrieved. An interesting little side story on that is uh, he, there was two, um, two cast um, stowaways on board when they left Malta. It was discovered three days later. There were two little Maltese kittens that, that somehow <laughs> got on board. So. Um, the uh, second officer, Smith, had tucked them into his, um, into his jacket as he's being winched ashore, and the waves were bra you know, you know, breaking over the bucket in him. So the poor cats were soaked, soaked by the time they got to shore. Um, three week, I mean, the ne next day, salvage lighters arrived. Three weeks uh, of strong southeasterly uh, winds prevented any, anything happening. But uh, finally, on March 22nd, six large tugs pulled her off, pulled her into the pan pancake ground of Gloucester. Uh, a diver got underneath, patched two of the five compartments. Next day, she was towed to Boston. Um, the, the cook on board, there was a premonition of the cook on board in Malta. He refused to go on board uh, because he had a premonition of disaster for the Wilster and his crew was coming back. And uh, one of the two kittens uh, was adopted by the, ga by, um, the uh, Gap Head uh, light, Life Saving Station and uh, spent its last years as, as their mascot. So. <laughs> Now, uh, most people know Hollywood movie movie industry, but uh, and that's they think that's the place it was all founded. But actually, the early American um, film industry was founded on the East Coast of the United States in New York and uh, in, in other other big city, East Coast cities. Uh, Cape Ann in the early 1900s had two movies filmed, uh, uh, and uh, one of uh, and they both vessels both. Both um, movies needed uh, shipwreck scenes uh, and pirates, so they needed. Uh, they call, put the call out for um, for derelict vessels that the you know film crews could uh, rig out to uh, you know set for the uh, you know the dialogue of the movies. Uh, early November 1914, the Peerless Picture Company uh, out of New York uh, was producing a movie as E. Sowed. Uh, uh, director Frank Crane uh, loved Cape Ann's topography. He needed a shipwreck scene. Um, he put the word out, and this Thomas E. Uh, e. Reed owned, uh, owned uh, an old rotted schooner, the island, old island home. Uh, it was, had been condemned. It was um, tied up in the inner harbor, but a deal was struck. Uh, the location of the, um, the scene was going to be filmed in Brace Cove. Once again, that false cove, rocky, all rock, you know, disaster area. Uh, 8 a.m., uh, November 23rd, um, 1914, the uh, director uh, ordered a ordered it out of the harbor around Eastern Point into, um, uh, into Brace Cove. At 11 a.m., Captain uh, Andrew Jacobs of the tugboat Eveleth started to tow the uh, island home. Uh, four men were on board the old derelict schooner, and Captain Charles Mar Martin, Jr., uh, William Salter, Cornelius Lynn, and Savila Pulasco. Uh, those were the four individuals aboard. The weather had all of a sudden, it was nice and calm when he, uh, the director ordered it out of the harbor. But all of a sudden, a huge storm started kicking up as they're going around Eastern Point. Um, Captain Mar Martin was steering the vessel as best as he could under tow. Uh, the schooner, uh, what happened was the, the directors on shore, numerous cameras being filmed, hundreds and hundreds of people on the shoreline watching the, you know, the filming of this. And the director says, cut this tow line, and, and here's the shipwreck scene coming in. And unfortunately, what happens is the uh, the ship scooter turns broadside to the ledge. You know, it doesn't come in bow first, and also the waves. It just get, gets in broad, just before uh, impact. Uh, two two guys retreated on board to an dory that was towed. They made it safely away, but uh, Captain Martin and uh, William Salter were still aboard at an impact. 
uh, the main mast on impact collapsed, falling onto the deck, nearly missing um, one of the, the captains. The foremast went next. The superstar structure started collapsing in the surge. Uh, Meanwhile, people were you know, they're filming, filming, filming. The door, a tug from the dory was strung back towards the wreck. The foremast was hanging over the water. Two men crawled out onto the dory and made it into the dory safely. The dory pulled back, and the two ca the cameramen were still filming. The director thought it was great. <laughs> you had that experience. And it was a wrap. And as you saw, it tried looking up. It's one of Hollywood's lost movies, but they, they do have a, um, a, a film, uh, they have a poster of it. But and the next one, uh, the next one I'm going to talk about is uh, in 19, uh, November 1919, Brides Number 13, Fox Film Company. Director Richard Stanton was the director of it. Uh, this was an epic pirate adventure. Okay, so once again they needed a, uh, another uh, another vessel. This is going to be a pirate vessel. They built it. Uh, actually built a castle on Salt Island, right off of Good Harbor Beach. And this was this castle was to be blown up in the movie. Um, there were maidens in distress also in this movie. Uh, but the schooner Manola, which was an old rotted schooner, uh, was drafted into uh, being the, the make-believe pirate ship. She was tied up at Davis Docks in, in the Inner Harbor. She was made to look like a pirate. She had a yard arm and a crow's nest and everything else was put up by the you know, studio. November 15th, 1919, she was towed to Brace Cove. Once again, they're going to be filming in deadly Brace Cove. Um, once the release, the pirate. Once the, the tugboat released it, the pirate battle begins, and they're, you know, swords flashing, and and uh, the the the, uh, the director ordered the two men up in the uh, crow's nest to jump into the water uh, as part of the scene. But unfortunately, you're talking late November, uh, and that water's cold. So uh, William Carr and the James Bird song got jumped into the from the crow's nest into the water. All of a sudden, and and hundreds of people are watching this. Both of them are struggling in the water, starting to go under. Uh, in the next scene, the, the main mast actually snaps to the starboard, nearly killing them in the water. The, uh, the scooter was blown up uh, with dynamite and oil later in the day for more special effects. But the old scooter built in 1860, so, you know, very old, you know, seven, you know like a 60-year-old vessel. She went out with a bang. <laughs> this right here is the island home. And it, was the one previous to that? Yeah, that's that's the island home right there, and that this one over here is the Manola right there. Before before they really blew her up, I mean they burnt her. But you can see, like, yeah. Wow. This is um this is uh the freighter uh, Rio Branco, um, September uh, 17th, 1939. Um, war broke out September 1st, so we're talking World War II. Uh, September 16th, uh, 1939, the vessel approaching Cape Ann. Uh, the, the Rio Branco uh, it was a clear starlight night while uh, war had broke out two weeks earlier but she was a registered Norwegian vessel you can see um, you can see the uh, let me see you can see the Norwegian flag right on the side here painted clearly uh, there were you know afraid of the U-boats out there uh, she had left power of Brazil <coughs> for Boston uh, with a cargo of uh, cocoa beans in wheat bran um, Meanwhile, America wasn't at war, just the European, uh, you know, uh, parties. Uh, she had 29 crew members uh, and five paying customers, and the captain's wife and daughter were also aboard. At 3 a.m. Uh, September 17th, the captain spots two lights clearly marking the harbor entrance. Not a ripple on the water, beautiful starlight uh, night. Thought he was entering Broad Sound, Boston. Now, he didn't obviously look at his charts well. As he passed the second, the uh, land was sighted. He put the engine in reverse, but it was too late. The, he sounded the whistle, and the Coast Guard uh, notified uh, by, she struck uh, inside, just inside Brace Cove once again, just inside Eastern, Eastern Point. Not really in the cove, but closer to Eastern Point, but down the ocean side of it. Um, Coast Guard was notified by the Eastern Point residents. By now, 1939, there are houses out there, and you know things are uh, uh, at low tide, the freighter who was perched high uh, on a large boulder just forward uh, at midship. Uh, she had a double hull construction, fortunately. At noon, the high tide, uh, she let the, the, the crew and passengers all left the vessel. Three huge salvage trucks, uh, the Neptune, Loon, and Thor arrived. Two lines parted in a salvage attempt to snap. Salvage lighters uh, were called in to offload the cargo. Uh, 4,700 tons of cargo were offloaded. 
Divers put temporary patches of concrete in number three hole. Saturday, September 23rd, um, so like, you know, six days later, four kedge anchors from the stern were set out and a 100 ton uh, steam tugboat, the Peacock, pulled her the Branco free. Once pre, uh, free under power, she moved off of Niles Beach. Divers put further patches in her, and later that day she was um, towed to uh, dry docks and Boston for repairs. That's a real Branco. Um, this is uh, <coughs> the drag, fishing drag of KDD, uh, December 30th, uh, 1962. She was 87 feet long. She arrived in Gloucester at four a, uh, with four day, after four days of a fishing trip on the night of December 30th, 1962. She headed to unload at the producer's wharf at Fort Point. Weather was uh, minus 10 degrees with 65 to 70 mile an hour winds. Uh, Captain Vito, I'm going to butcher this name, Car Carol Mendo, Carol. Kimitaro. yes, thank you. Um, uh, with 20,000 pounds of fresh uh, fish, was hoping to get a good winter price. Uh, the main engine conked out near the docks and she drifted across the harbor, crashing on the boulders near the paint factory building. Uh, Mayday was heard by the Dollar's Neck Station, Coast Guard Station. In 1962, they had not yet moved over to the Inner Harbor. They were over uh, off of, off of uh, Dollar's on the other side of the harbor. Uh, Chief Warrant Officer uh, Crowley sent out, out a three-man crew on a 36-foot lifeboat. Uh, uh, Bosun mate um, Leonard Bolcher steered and Seaman Allen uh, Hobson and engineer John Stilson were also aboard. The ride across the harbor in zero visibility, high wind, snow and cold was a ferocious adventure. Uh, they took three men, they board, came alongside the, um, the KDD, they took three men off and the others wanted to save, stay aboard, try to save the, not only the vessel but the cargo. That was their payday. Um, meanwhile, you can see that everything's icing up and there's a huge spray going on. Um, the, um, as, as the lifeboat was backing away, uh, one of the lines hanging over the side wrapped around uh, one of the crew members uh, trying to relieve the strain on his mangled leg. They, uh, they had to cut it, but he was, he was fine. The, the, what happened was the line hanging over the side caught, uh, wrapped around the lifeboat and uh, wheel and cocked it out. So they drifted, drifted, drifted onto Niles Beach. And go to the next one. This is the next day. The lifeboat is up on Niles Beach. Uh, he's chopping the ice off of it right now. But they safely, you know, they were they were okay. Um, they climbed up and they were taken in by uh, people in the houses up there. The KDT's cargo was dumped later, spoiled because of the floated, fl uh, flooded cargo hull. Divers put temporary patches in her hull, towed her off, and she was died dry docked. A few weeks later, she was back. In, weeks later, she was back in service. This is the Chester Poling, January 10th, 1977. Uh, she was 280 feet long. Coastal tanker uh, unloaded kerosene at, in Everett and was preparing to head back in Ballaston, Newington, uh, New Hampshire. Captain Charles Burgess uh, monitored the forecast. It was 35 miles an hour, uh, seas 15 to 20 feet. He made the decision to go. A vessel that size, that's not really too, too unthinkable. Um, 6.30 a.m., uh, they left, they left uh, 10 a, uh, uh, January 10th, 1977. She steamed out of Boston Harbor. Soon winds and seas, uh, started to build more than expected. Six miles off of Cape Ann, the quarter, the captain ordered four of the six holes filled with water for stability. Once again, ballast. Instead of rocks, they're putting water in to ballast the vessel down. Captain believed that once uh, he had rounded Cape Ann, she'd uh, be riding a following sea to Newington. But 70 mile an hour winds were now engulfing her at 10.30 at night. Uh, at 10, uh, at 10 30 in the morning, rather, at a rogue wave struck her broadside on the starboard side. Uh, the vessel snapped in two amidship. The captain, the crew, and Harry Selleck were on the bow. The five others were on the stern. Uh, Selleck saw the, uh, the bow tear away, swing along to the stern up against them, and then drift away. So you're looking at your porthole going, that shouldn't be there. You know? <laughs> so it's, it's this dire situation going on. Um, Mayday was called out. Coast Guard sends a 41 and a 44 vessel out there, as well as a Coast Guard cutter, Cape George and Cape Cross. It was too windy for a helicopter at the time. Now, the vessel, the pilot boat, the Can Do, was also involved in this. I don't know if you know the Blizzard of 78. They, five men died aboard the Can Do at the Blizzard of 78. But this is the year before. Um, so the Can Do's out there trying to respond to the call, too. Uh, the, the wreck was now drifting closer and closer to Dog Bar in Eastern, uh, Eastern Point. Uh, small, the small boats arrived, and later the cutters, uh, 
uh, start seeing the seeing the uh, the, lip, the bow lifting over the uh, uh, semi-submerged section of the, of the stern. Captain Burgess and uh, Selleck leaped into the icy waters, and they were retrieved by the uh, cutter uh, Cape George. Helicopter finally arrives on because uh, uh, the wind's starting to cut down. Well, it flies over the stern in zero visibility. The va vessel, uh, the basket hits the deck. The ship's cook uh, leaps toward it, but falls 30 feet into the raging sea without a life jacket. It was never seen. Uh, three other crew members leaped into the sea. Two were rescued by the cutter, one by the helicopter. The bow sank four miles off the of eastern point, the stern 800 yards off a of dog bar and 100 feet of water. Um, I dove on it, this is in uh, January, I dove, it on, I dove on it the next March. And these are some of the underwater photos I took. There's no, not even barnacles or anything on it. Uh, that's part of the deck. Um, next one. And that's actually the stern. You can see the, the you know, chest of holding written on it. Um, and I was went down there with all my wrenches and my hacksaws. I was going to cut some portholes, but somebody, I think Bob Reed in, uh, in Manchester, he was another commercial driver, but he had cutting. He went down there before me. He got all the good stuff. So, <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, it was an interesting dive, and she's she's now a popular dive site uh, for recreational divers in Cape Ann. Um, she was built in uh, 1934 at Mariners Harbor, New York, and um, she uh, that was the chest of holding. Uh, shipwrecks still uh, occur off of Cape Ann, and this is November 11th, 2016. This is the ocean, Blue Ocean uh, uh, Eastern Rig Dragger on Niles Beach. She actually was an old wooden dragger, but she was still functioning. They couldn't get her off. They had to cut her up, and she ended up, um, and that spread up in Niles Beach inside Boston. Uh, so, but that's, uh, that's the gist of it all. Uh, any questions? that you're talking about the 17th and 18th century and 19th century, the rules about salvage.